So we do have now the third speaker from Georgia Institute of Technology, Jin Yuan Zheng, right? Her paper's title is Coverage Analysis for Multi-Hub Communication in Intelligence Surface Assisted Millimeter Wave VLAN. So a little different topic this time. Hopefully you will enjoy her talk. Hi everyone, my name is Xin Yuan and I'm a PhD candidate from Georgia Tech. Today I will present our work on the coverage analysis for multi-hop communication in intelligence surface assisted middleweight networks. Uh, to start with, I will introduce what reconfigurable intelligence is and why it is used in middleweight networks. First of all, millimeter wave network has been proposed to support high data rate communication for the next generation of wireless networks because it can provide large available bandwidth. But it has the drawback of uh, non line of sight issues. So it means that the millimeter wave signal is sensitive to blockages. Even there is just a daily object like furniture or wall that is located between the transmitter and receiver, then it is very likely that there is no direct communication link between them. So how can we solve this issue? The intuitive idea is that we can use a relay node to receive the signal from the transmitter and redirect the signal towards the receiver. And luckily, in recent years, there is a structure called Reconfigurable Intelligence Service, which is also called RIS, that has been proposed to serve as this relay node. So what is this RIS? RIS is an array of reflective uh, elements where the reflection coefficient of each element can be reconfigured as needed. So this feature has enabled RIS to have the uh, advantage of dynamic beam management. In other words, the RS can be used to uh, redirect the incoming beam towards any arbitrary directions. So in this case, the RS has have been proposed uh, to improve the signal coverage in millimeter wave network for the next generation of application. And currently, there are many papers that focus on the single RS links, which means that there's just one RS in the communication link. And in recent years, there are a few papers that start working on uh, the motors link, and they try to uh, design the multi-hub routing for motors links. But the motors link usually come with the cost of extra delay and overhead, which is caused by the routing. So there's a problem arising here. Is it worthwhile using motors links? Do motors links provide more reliable connectivity? To answer this question, we have to consider it from two aspects. First of all, if we have multiple RS in a link, then it means that we should have better path diversity. We should have more paths to choose from to let the signal avoid the blockages. And second, the RSs can provide larger beam forming gain if we have an increasing size of the RS array. So it means that a multi RS link has the potential to offset the signal propagation loss. Uh, uh, if we can choose uh, the proper size of the RS array. So this is our first motivation. We want to know how to choose between single RS and multi links. And the second motivation is that if we have decided what type of uh, link we want to use, we still need to know how to deploy the RSs. So for example, we need to know how many RSs and how large the RS array size we need to use given a specific blockage distribution. And to answer all of those questions, the first step is that we need to understand the performance limit of the multi R links. But currently, there's just very limited work on it. So here are our goals. First of all, we want to provide a theoretical model to analyze the coverage performance of both single RS and multi R links in terms of the obstacle avoidance. And second, we also want to use this model to provide guidance on the RS deployment given the obstacle distribution. Um, now I will introduce the system model used in our analysis. So we built our system model based on stochastic geometry and stochastic geometry is a widely used tool to do analytical network performance analysis. 
And typically, the critical network components are modeled as spatial Poisson point process. So here we follow the same rule. We assume that the RS locations and optical locations are modeled as two independent spatial Poisson point processes. So if we look at the figure here, and here is the illustration of the top view of the system setting. And we have a pair of transmitter and a receiver. Uh, all of those uh, small rectangles represent the blockages and all of the uh, short red segments represent the RS device. And here we assume that for each RS device, there are two back-to-back -back attached RS arrays. So it means that both sides of the RS device can support the transmission link. So if we go back to this figure again, uh, it means that if the transmitter and the receiver are located on the same side of this RS device, then this RS location can provide, can, uh, has the potential to provide a transmission link. And uh, because it's a model based on stochastic geometry, so our model can be used in uh, scenarios where there are randomly located blockages. For example, it can be used in some large indoor scenarios, including uh, stadiums and uh, enterprise settings. And it is also assumed that it's sparse optical distribution because our analysis used an assumption of independent line of sight status on different links. So it means that whether different links are blocked by uh, obstacles are independent. So the reason that we use this assumption is that uh, the correlation of uh, the line of sight status is a term that is really hard to be uh, quantified. But we will show in the simulation part that uh, even if it's uh, denser obstacle distribution, our proposed a theoretical model can st still provide some useful insights. And next is about the receipt power model of the multi -RS link. So for a communication link, uh, the link should provide adequate receipt power at the receiver so that it can provide uh, adequate uh, communication quality. So this receipt power model can help us to understand how to choose uh, possible RS links. And uh, this is the figure uh, that illustrate the, the M R S link, where there are M R S S and M plus one path segments in this link. And the high level takeaway of this receipt power model is that if we know the R S array size, and we also know the link budget parameters, including the transmit power and the minimum receipt power, then we should know the maximum value of the, uh, the length of the M plus one path segments in this figure. And this is a conclusion that we will use to derive uh, the coverage performance of uh, the RS links. And finally, in order to uh, analyze the coverage performance, we define a metric that is called connection probability. So this is a probability uh, that there exists at least one proper link that can provide adequate receipt power. And at the same time, it is an unblocked link. Uh, now we will talk about the coverage analysis of the single RS link first. Uh, before we go to the connection probability, first of all, we need to understand what kind of RSs can provide a proper uh, communication link. So recall that there are two conditions. The first is that we should have adequate receipt power. And the second condition is that it should be an unblocked link. So let's look at the first condition first. Um, uh, if we know the link budget parameters and we also know the RS array size and the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, then the possible RS locations that, that can provide adequate receipt power should be located in an oval called Cassini oval, which is represented by the blue curves in these two figures. And a high level interpretation of the shape of this oval is that if the link budget, and, uh, if the link budget parameters uh, are fixed, then if we gradually increase the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, then the shape of this oval will gradually turn from the figure in the left to the figure in the right. Okay, so this is about the first condition. And the second condition is about the unblocked link. Um, typically, the stochastic geometry model can tell us the connection probability if we only consider the blockages. But in our model, the RS device itself can also block the signal. So actually in our model, we have taken this factor into consideration. And I will not go into much details about uh, the mathematical things about that. Uh, so based on all of those discussions, we have uh, 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 the right, uh, the connection probability of single RS links and uh, the high level, the high level understanding of this uh, conclusion is that 
we can derive the analytical connection probability for single RS links if we know all of the following parameters, including the distance between a transmitter and the receiver, the link budget parameters, and optical and RS distributions. So here is a very simple example to uh, illustrate what kind of results we could get, get by using this model. So if we know the optical and RS distribution and we vary the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, then we could know how the connection probability uh, changes for the single RS link. And uh, similarly, we have also derived an upper bound for the connection probability of multi RS links if uh, the same uh, system parameters are given. And uh, I just want to uh, illustrate a, a little bit about why this is an upper bound in this case. So there's a specific correlation term that is really hard to be quantified in this case. And I will use this uh, figure to illustrate a little bit about it. So if we want to have an MRS link, one of the possibilities is that uh, for a po possible RS location, then there should be a line of sight path between the receiver and RS. And there should also be a M minus one RS link path between the RS and the transmitter. However, the events that there exists the M minus one RS link between the transmitter and different RS locations are correlated with each other. And this is something that is uh, really hard to be quantified uh, from a mathematical perspective. But we will show in the simulation part that even if it's an upper bound, it can still provide uh, useful insights about uh, the connection probability. And then let's talk about the simulation results. We have considered two different optical densities in our simulation, a sparse one and a denser one. And I used two different uh, figures here, which represent an area with uh, an area with size 20 meter by 20 meter to help us better understand how dense those obstacles are. And um, I also provide uh, the connection probability for line of sight link here to help us understand how those obstacle distributions have impact on the uh, connection probability. So if you look at uh, the without here, uh, which is the connection probability uh, uh, for uh, the line of sight link in the denser optical distribution. So the connection probability for a line of sight path with length of 30 meters is 23.3 percentage. And if it's a longer distance communication where the path length is 150 meters, then this probability drops to nearly zero. And first of all, let's look at the results for the single RC. Uh, in both of the figures, uh, uh, the x axis represents uh, the RS array size and y axis represents the connection probability. The figure in the left represents the case where it's a shorter distance, distance communication, where the uh, distance between transmitter and the receiver is 30 meters. And in the figure in the right, the distance is 150 meters. Uh, in both of the figures, uh, all of those discrete labels represent the simulation results, and all of the other curves represent uh, the theoretical results provided by our model. And uh, all of those blue curves and labels represent uh, the case with denser optical distribution, and all the red ones represent the case with sparse optical distribution. And lastly, uh, the solid curve represents the case with higher RS density compared with the curve, uh, the, the dashed curve. So the first observation is that there's just very slight gap between simulation and the proposed analysis. So it can validate our proposed uh, uh, theoretical conclusions. And second, if we compare the two figures, then we can observe that the single R sync can, uh, it's, it's better for the short distance communication. And uh, lastly, if we, uh, we can also have some understanding about how to improve the uh, connection probability more efficiently if we look at the uh, blue curves in this figure. So uh, according to this figure, it's more efficient to increase the RS density rather than just only increasing the RS array size. Because if we only increase the RS array size, then uh, the connection probability, probability gradually reaches a plateau. And next is about the results for two RS things. Um, so the first observation is that the gap, be, uh, gap between the analysis and simulation is larger here. But if we only focus on the sparse case where uh, uh, 
well, which is represented by those uh, red curves, then the proposed analytical results serve as an upper bound. But uh, if it's a denser case, then actually there are some points that are slightly above the proposed upper bound. So recall that our proposed uh, analytical results are based on the assumption of the uh, independence of the line of size statuses, which, uh, uh, and this assumption holds if it's a sparse obstacle distribution. But even if uh, it's a denser obstacle distribution case, and uh, even if there are some points that are slightly above the proposed upper bound, our analytical results can still um, match with the simulation closely. And uh, if we uh, compare these two figures, the first observation is that the two R's link uh, can be used to improve the connection probability in a longer distance communication. And why is that? There are two reasons for that. The first one, the first one is that if we can use more R access in the link, then it should provide better path diversity to do the optical avoidance. And the second, uh, the two RS links can provide uh, satisfying connection probability if we choose medium to large size of RS arrays. So it means that uh, if, we uh, if we choose proper RS array size, then it can provide um, adequate beam forming gain to help with the communication link. And finally, in order to have a more comprehensive comparison between single RS and two RS link, we also have a simulation to show the overall connection probability. And I will illustrate that a little bit. So the figure in the left still represents a case for the short, uh, short distance communication, and figure in the right represents a longer distance communication. And in these two figures, uh, the black curves represent the case where we do not use RS access at all. And the blue curves represent the case for single R's link. So it means that we can have a communication link if there is a line of sight pass, or there exists at least one single R's path. And the red curve represents uh, the two RS system. So it means that we can have a communication link if there's line of sight pass or single R's path or two R's paths. So if we look at these two figures, then we can have a similar conclusion. So first of all, if we look at the case for the short distance communication, apparently we can improve the connection probability by using the single R system, but there's hardly any improvement if we use the two R system. And if we go to the figure in the right, which is uh, which represents the longer distance communication, apparently if we use two R systems, then it can significantly improve the connection probability if we choose proper uh, RS array sizes. And now let's conclude uh, the presentation. Uh, our contribution is that we have proposed an analytical model for coverage analysis in multi-hub RS assisted communication with sparse optimal distribution. And what can this model do? Uh, it can help us to understand the performance limit for multi-hub RS assisted communication. And it can also help us, uh, it can also help to provide the guidance for RS deployment in millimeter wave networks. And the last thing is that this is a general framework. So this analytical model can be extended for different types of RSs. So what does it mean by different types of RSs? Our model has target, uh, our model target at the RS array that is just a reflective array. And in recent years, there are some other type of RS arrays. So there's a, something called transmissive array, which means that the signal can go through this array. And in other words, this array can be used to redirect the signal to both sides of this device. So our model can be used, can, can be extended to do some analysis also for this type of RS assets. So one of the direction for the future work is that we want to do a comparative study between the uh, reflective array and the transmissive array. And if we want to apply the theoretical model to some practical applications, there are some challenges and limitations. For example, uh, uh, we should need, we still need to improve the model to make it uh, apply to the dense obstacle, to let that apply to the scenarios with dense obstacle distribution. And uh, there's all, there are also some challenges if you want to apply it to a 3D case where the height for like RSs, transmitter and receiver are all on the different heights. And uh, for the, the classic geometry model, it assumes that it's somewhat like a uniform distribution. But in the real world scenario, sometimes it's we have a non-uniform distribution. So these are all the challenges and limitations for the theoretical model, but it can also open up some uh, 
uh, possible future directions for this uh, research. And that's all for the presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. That was nice. Cool. Uh, questions? Yes. Lots of formulas or something. I, I do have, I, I will, while you guys are thinking, I have a question actually. I, I don't do IRS research, but like the or RIS or IRS people keep saying different things. Yes. But I had a colleague, I worked with some others. And in the meantime, like, because you showed like result with simulations, right? Mm -hmm. I think the, do you, did you use your own simulators or did there out there some simulators people are trying to standardize that we evaluate this in, in, uh, research, right? I was one, I want to start with that. Yeah. Oh, actually, I wrote the simulation codes uh, on my own. It's not an existing simulator, actually. Okay. So then the question is like, have you ever worked with a real hardware, like RIS hardware? Oh, or the, is it how 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 close your simulator is? That's what I want. I mean, that question. Okay. okay. So actually, during my PhD study, I mostly work on the theoretical uh, uh, research. So we try to build the, the theoretical model to analyze the network performance and uh, uh, do some uh, system or algorithm design. And uh, it is true that if we just work on the theoretical things, it, there should be some gap between the simulator and the real world scenario. And uh, uh, so for, for some of the work like this, we want to build a, a theoretical model to analyze the large scale network performance. It could be really hard to do some uh, experiments because it's, it's a large scale things. So uh, currently we do not consider some very practical factors like radiation pattern for this array. And this is something that could be a little bit hard to be included in this kind of analytical uh, analysis. So I think our model can be used to provide some high level uh, guidance on how to deploy those uh, systems. And it can provide some like understanding for the performance limit of these systems. Right. Yes. Anybody? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not familiar with uh, RIS, uh, so it was interesting to hear about them. Uh, you already mentioned that you, you consider 2D, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming you can elevate them and get better performance. So you said that that's a feature work uh, consideration? Yeah, this should be a possible direction for future research. And uh, if we consider random randomly distributed obstacles, uh, 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 let us first uh, ignore some practical impacts. For example, about uh, for example, the impacts about the receipt power. If the height for the transmitter is above all of the obstacles, then the intuitive understanding is that it can improve the connection probability if we do not consider the uh, receipt power. So, right. if we change the height for the devices, then there should be a trade-off. Like if we keep increasing the, the height for no matter it's transmitter or it's receiver, then the the connection probability could increase, right. but it could reduce the receipt power. So there should be a trade-off there. Okay. Yeah. So uh, perhaps one uh, suggestion here might be, I don't know, what is the monetary cost for these RAS, RAS units? Uh, like you want to deploy them in, in a stadium, for instance. I think there's a cost associated with it, right? So could we add cost in your analysis? Like if you spend uh, more money or less money compared to no uh, RIS case, uh, how do we uh, perform in terms of performance and, and uh, cost trade-off? Uh, the cost for this uh, system, right? Right, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, if we consider the RIS system, apparently the, the cost should increase compared with the system without any uh, our assets. But for the minimum to weight uh, system, uh, one of the critical issues is that the signal can be blocked by obstacles uh, easily. So uh, to solve the, uh, so so solving the issue of uh, signal blockage is a very critical issue for uh, minimum weight networks. And uh, to solve this problem, there is some other type of solutions. First one is how we can deploy different, uh, de deploy multiple transmitters. And uh, the the second conclusion is that we can uh, deploy some of such reflective nodes. 
And if we compare the costs between uh, multiple active transmitters and the passive reflectors, then according to uh, the existing papers, the cost for the RSs sh should be uh, uh, smaller than the, those active uh, devices. All right, so we're gonna move on and let's thank the speaker. Okay.